good morning and welcome to Begin in the Word. Today we continue our studies in the gospel according to Luke. We're up to Luke chapter 1 now, verse 71 through 75. Thank you for joining us for today's study. Luke 1 now, verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Now, what we're talking about here is we're in the middle of a section where the father of John the Baptist, that's Zacharias, is prophesying about the coming of the Christ and the work of his son who was to grow up and be a man of God who would prepare the way for the Christ. So his prophecy embraces uh, largely the work of Christ, but also speaks somewhat of the work of his son in preparing the way for Christ. And in the previous study, we talked about the anticipation of the Messiah being a horn of salvation, being our Savior, the strength of God working through his ministry, bringing us salvation, and him coming into the world, into the family line of David. And here he takes up the purpose of Christ coming into the world, into the family line of David, and that is the purpose to save us from our enemies. Now, looking at this only from a carnal perspective, a person might think that, well, this is about saving Israel from the enemy nations that surrounded them and delivering them from their oppressors. But that is a short-sighted view of the messianic work. And that is a view that frankly ignores the Abrahamic promise. Because the Abrahamic promise given in Genesis to Israel's ancestor Abraham was not just that Messiah would be a blessing exclusive to the nation of Israel, but that he was to bless all nations. To save Israel from other nations is not a blessing to all nations. That's a blessing only to Israel. So Messiah's work would encompass something that would bring a blessing to everybody of every nation, not just Israel. So the salvation from our enemies here is not just uh, enemies of Israel, but it's enemies of the people of all nations. And that, my friends, is Satan. The Bible speaks of Satan as our enemy or our adversary. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 teaches us to be sober or sober-minded because our adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There we learn that Satan is the adversary or the enemy, not only of Israel, but of all of mankind. And Christ came to save us from Satan's work. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, 1 John 3 and verse 8, both speak of the net effect of Christ's work being to defeat Satan and defeat his work. Now, you might look at the text and say, well, but he says, save us from our enemies in a plural sense. And Satan is only a singular enemy. Well, it's true that Satan is only a singular individual, but by virtue of Satan's uh, work and his temptation of Adam and Eve, he brought other enemies upon mankind. And so you can think of the plurality of these enemies in the plural sense as being sin and death. Because Satan successfully tempted Adam and Eve to sin and eat the forbidden fruit, we're going back to the story of Genesis chapter 3 now, that brought sin and that brought death upon all of humankind. And so Satan being our enemy brings other uh, enemies with him against us and the effect of his work creates the enemy of sin and death. And when we read about the salvation of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55 through 57, we read that that is what Christ has freed us from. In defeating Satan, our primary enemy, in his saving work of defeating Satan, he has, in effect, defeated sin and death. We could reverse that and say, by defeating sin and death, Christ has therefore defeated Satan because those are the sum total of his work upon mankind. Now, what else does the narrative in Luke 1 tell us about all of this, this saving work of Christ being from Satan and from sin and death? Well, he says this is just like the Abrahamic promise had foretold. 
Luke 1, 72 through 75, perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteous before him, righteousness before him all the days of our life. So he says this salvation that Christ brings is according to the Abrahamic promise. Now, you remember that just a moment ago in this study, I talked about the Abrahamic promise in Genesis 22 and 18 said that the seed, that is the Messiah, was to be a blessing to all nations, not just Israel. In Israel, some in the first century, in the narrowness of their thinking, did not look in faith at the details of the Abrahamic promise and did not accept that that promise all along was not just for Israel but that was for everybody. And here, Zacharias and his prophecy in Luke chapter one makes the point that that's what the promise was about all along, that the promise of sending a savior, the promise that's made to the fathers that was given to Abraham, that's God's holy covenant with Abraham and his offspring. And that is a covenant that brings blessing to all nations. And the seed of that seed promise is referring to Christ. Now, here at the beginning of the word, we've had detailed verse by our studies on the book of Galatians. If you've not listened to those in the past, I would encourage you to go back and listen to those. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 16, we read there that Christ is the subject seed of that promise. That when he said the seed of Abraham is blessing all nations, that seed refers to Jesus Christ. And you can listen to those studies uh, also here on our YouTube channel and hear those things expanded upon. So the Abrahamic promise was an early part of God's promise to send his son into the world. It's not the first prophecy. Remember from earlier studies in Luke 1, we found out that there were prophets since the beginning of time that were talking about these things. Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy of Messiah's work. But on the the grander scale of human history, the Abrahamic promise element of those messianic prophecies is indeed an earlier uh, prophecy to come in the larger prophetic timeline. And it's all part of God's promise to send his son into the world. And when we look at the details here of uh, Zechariah expanding on the Abrahamic promise, he says, that it embraces the idea of us being delivered from the hand of our enemies. Now, to just give a casual glance to that, a person might think that, well, that's a deliverance of Israel from enemy nations that surrounded them. And we've already addressed that idea in this study, but I want to continue to look at that language. When you take that language back to the prophets in the Old Testament, And if you want to pause the video and look these verses up, they're here for your convenience. Isaiah 35, 9 and 10, Isaiah 54, 13 and 14, Isaiah 65, 21 through 25, Ezekiel 34, 25 through 28. In all of those instances, the prophecies use physical deliverance, peace and prosperity as symbols of spiritual deliverance. Now, it's not within the scope of today's study to go into a detailed examination of those prophecies in their context, but suffice to say that in their context, there's uh, places where you can see language that anchors those prophecies to the Messianic work. Isaiah 54 is from a larger section of Isaiah's prophecy that deals with the suffering servant of Isaiah. The previous chapter is a familiar prophecy that deals with the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Isaiah 65 is a prophecy of the coming new covenant age and the salvation God would bring to his people. And you find similar kinds of themes dealt with in that section of Ezekiel there surrounding Ezekiel chapter 34. So clearly the idea of deliverance from the hands of our enemies, when we go back to the prophetic language where Uh, That kind of language is used, other examples and prophecies. The context of those prophecies makes it clear that such symbols point to Christ's saving work and our spiritual peace in his kingdom, not the mere physical status of merely one nation among many nations of man.
God's plan to save and the scope of that plan reaches far beyond the borders of physical Israel and reaches out and can even touch your life if you come to Jesus according to his will and faithfully follow him as he teaches us in his word. Are you following the word of Christ in your life today? Are you faithfully serving him in the way that he teaches in his word? These are very important questions, and we're glad that you've joined us for today's study to consider these things, especially as what we're learning from the gospel according to Luke. We're so glad that you've joined us for today's study. And as we've begun today in the word, I pray that you'll live out today and every day in the mighty word of God. Thank you and God bless.